Hello everyone, welcome, welcome. Thank you all for coming. Quite a decent amount of you today, gonna get quite a little community going. So thank you all uh, for joining today. I'm really excited about this session. It's something I've been wanting to run for a really, really long time. And I know that lots of you have loads and loads of questions. Big thank you to those of you who have already sent in some questions which we've looked at and we're tailoring our questions around the ones that you've sent in in advance as well as some other questions about Alison's and Raymond's career. So first of all, a very warm welcome. Just to kick off with a little bit of housekeeping, this is a, a Zoom meeting rather than a webinar. So the best way to get sort of the most out of it and make sure that you're seeing and hearing from the panelists, the best way is to keep your microphones on mute and then change your view to speak of you. And that way you will just see us three talking on your screen rather than all of the other screens and participants that are actually in the meeting. Uh, please don't unmute yourself because you will then form part of the speak of you if you do that. Feel free to put your videos on, that's absolutely fine. We love to see your faces, get involved, but please, please keep your microphones on mute. So without further ado, let's get started on how to build your legal career in the UAE. Firstly, over to our panellists for a quick introduction. So Alison, do you want to tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do and your journey to and through the UAE? Oh my goodness me. Thanks, Chrissy. Um, first of all, I'm thrilled to be part of the Law and Broader session this afternoon. Um, it's fantastic to, to be involved and, and a big hello to everybody who's joined the call. I'm Alison Hosking. I'm a director of New Law uh, within PwC Legal. Um, and just very high level as to what I do. Um, so I run our legal department consulting team here at PwC across the Middle East region. Um, do you want me to do a little bit about what, how I got here, Chrissy? Would that be helpful? Yeah, definitely. I'd love to hear the whole journey because I know you've worked in so many different countries in so many different firms and it's so fascinating. So yeah, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Okay, so I thought I would have a very traditional route to law and continue my career in a very traditional way with the ambition of joining as a trainee and then ending up as a partner, thinking that I would stay in the UK. That has been uh can, and my journey has been so different to what I thought was going to happen so I qualified into the banking practice at what is now Hogan Lovells in London um during my training contract this is quite a long time ago I got married I married somebody who I'm still married to um who became a British diplomat and he one day said, oh, I've been asked to go and move to Chile. And I was like, I don't, don't know where that is. Oh, it's the long, thin one down the side of South America. Okay, what am I going to do there? And I was about a year qualified at the time. So we moved to Chile. I was a very ambitious, enthusiastic, energetic lawyer and fortunately managed to have transferable skills. So as a banking lawyer, I was doing lots of restructuring and solvency work. I was able to kind of lift and shift what I was doing get my arms around decree law 600 which is the 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 Chilean banking law and drop anchor in Chile where I worked for an amazing Chilean law firm for almost four years we then moved back to the UK and I went to work for just thinking about this chronologically then I went to work for Alan and Overy so I was a managing associate in um, Alan and Overy in London doing horrendous hours. It was really quite a tough time. Another phone call from the husband, do you fancy moving to India? I was like, yeah, take me, let's go, let's go. <laughs> By this point, we got two small children. I was like, yeah, let's go, let's go to India. So we moved to India and I worked for Ashurst in India doing all sorts of stuff, actually. I didn't just do pure banking, financial work. I ended up doing, doing a bit of commercial work, a bit of projects work, all sorts of stuff. Amazing, it was a fantastic experience. Then we moved back to the UK and at this point I got three small children and I said I don't want to do practice law anymore so I went and taught on the GDL and the LPC courses at Nottingham Law School um, which was amazing, loved it, really fun job to do. Then we moved to New York and I joined Linklaters in New York back into the banking practice so me having said I don't want to do any more black letter law work I went back into it was in New York for about four years, then moved back to the UK with Linklaters, um, ended up stepping away from banking finally, and became the chief of staff to the senior partner. So I've had this really varied career, um, 
did that for about two years, then moved into back into a client facing role, but looking at innovation, efficiency, knowledge management. That then brought me to Dubai. Uh, my husband, by this point, had stopped being a British diplomat. So all of the previous places he uh, had been a diplomat, got four kids at this point, moved to Dubai with Link Later, stayed with them for I think maybe three years. And then I got headhunted by the largest regional law firm here, Altamimi. Stayed with them for about three years, again, doing innovation efficiency work. And then I approached PwC to talk to them about their new law um, offering. And that was September, 2020. So 2021, sorry, it, the time has gone too fast. So yeah, that's a very, very long CV condensed down. <laughs> Very, very long CV and absolutely fascinating. And I'm really excited to get a little bit more uh, into that a little bit later in the session. Um, just to hand over to, to Raymond now, who I know also has been all over the place, but doing slightly different things to you. So Raymond, do you want to talk to us a little bit about your history and, and how you got to where you got to? Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, hello, everyone. And excuse my my sort of granddad uh jumper here but i'm i'm in freezing north england um so um uh i'm sure if any of you are here um you're itching to uh come to dubai as much as i am um so um thanks very much for having me and and for enjoying um hopefully this uh, this could be a bit of uh, assistance to all of you um i mean the, the thing with me, I think, is um, while I think my career has been um, all of it in private practice, but getting to that career has been um, the most untraditional route, I suppose. Um, so I think, I think that that might be a little bit of help because certainly when I was uh, beginning my journey, um, everybody would look at me like that, uh, that I had five heads with the sort of background that I had. Um, because I didn't follow the traditional route of just uh, going into law school, getting a vacation scheme, then a training contract, et cetera. Um, so I was, um, I was born in the Middle East, actually. Um, and when, in, when I was seven, we moved to New Jersey, which is in the suburbs of uh, New York City. And... Um, I basically grew up there, um, went through the school system, and then did my undergraduate degree in New York City at a uh, university called Pace University, which is uh, just across the street from Wall Street, if you're in downtown. Um, and I studied political science and international relations there. Um, and in my final year, that was a four-year uh, degree, in my final year, I secured a, uh, an internship at the uh, United Nations headquarters. And that was an absolute dream to me. That became my obsession. So um, a bit like Allison's husband, my, my absolute dream was to either work for the UN or to work for the State Department as a diplomat. Um, I've always kind of been fascinated with international travel and um, living abroad. So um, those were literally my, my two um, career options. That's how, that's how wide my... 22 year old brain was working at the time. Um, and the advice that I was given by my uh, professors at the university was, if, if those are the, your, your sort of career uh, goals, then you should definitely get a master's in international relations or international affairs. And it would certainly help if you have that from somewhere abroad, because that gives you a bit of extra, extra kick. So off I went and applied to numerous places in like uh, Norway, the Netherlands, um, in international relations, international security, et cetera, um, was accepted to a good number of them. And then when, um, you know, kind of reviewing my, my options um, and discussing it with, um, with my parents, well, uh, with my mom, um, my mom was kind of scratching her head a little bit um, um, as to how I was narrowing my entire career life down to two jobs um, and obviously needing a little bit of uh, financial support from her. Um, so my very kind of practical, hard-nosed um, mom, uh, just because I do come from a family that are all from regulated professions, shall I say, 
They're all either doctors, um, architects, or engineers. So the concept of uh, you know diplomacy or UN or um, think tanks wasn't really on on their uh, on their list. Um, she convinced me that a law degree was a practical degree um, that I could still be able to apply to things like the UN and um, and the State Department, but at least I have, would have a fallback. Um, so, you know, I should say at this point, um, I didn't know any lawyers. I didn't know anything about what practicing law was like growing up. Um, literally the only, the only lawyer that I ever um, knew was my parents kind of solo practitioner that would help them with things like buying and selling a house. Um, I couldn't name you a single law firm. I didn't know what a partner at a law firm was. Um, I, I have a very vivid memory of my first year of law school when people were mentioning vacation scheme and I thought they were literally talking about a holiday. So, I mean, my, my knowledge base was, was very limited, shall I say. So um, off I went Googling, this is sort of 2006, 2007, off Googling um, uh, law schools, quickly found out that I would need an entrance exam uh, to get into a US law school and I wasn't prepared to take off um, six months to a year to do that. Um, long story short, I found that England would be, would be a good place for me to be able to, to go to. By this point, um, because I was very close to graduating, I believe, um, by this point, most applications were, were closed. Um, so that narrowed down my options. And I also... I didn't know what a GDL was at the time, um, but to me, sort of a diploma versus um, honors degree, one sounded better than the other. Um, and um, I noticed that virtually all of them were three-year undergraduate uh, courses, with the exception of, at the time, three that were also still accepting applications, um, Durham, Aberdeen, and uh, Birmingham. So off I went applying. Um, Birmingham happened to accept me first. Um, and so that was literally, I believe, about um, a month and a half before I moved to Birmingham and joined the LLB for Graduates program, which was a two year course. Um, and that's where I sort of uh, began. Now, I, I mean, not to sort of sound a bit depressing, but but it was a, a huge shock for me um, for a number of reasons. Um, one was that I had I had sort of had this four year course where I was um, studying um, topics that I wanted to choose on political things happening in Latin America or in the Middle East and researching it and writing essays about it. And here I was, um, you know, learning about offer acceptance and consideration and eggshell skull rule. I was uh, extremely bored and extremely um, annoyed because I didn't want to be there. This wasn't interesting to me in the slightest. Um, so that was kind of a good portion of my first year um, going into my second year. Um, because with the LLB for graduates program, you basically have to take all of the um, qualifying courses. So your contracts, um, constitution, um, et cetera, but you got one elective and you could either take a course or you could um, do a dissertation. And I literally thought about doing a dissertation purely because I didn't want to attend lectures um, on any of the, um, the courses. So uh, there was a, a board in the law school that you could go to to sort of uh, pick a supervisor and what topic, general topic you wanted to uh, research. I remember skimming it and there was two of them that had the word international in it. One was um, about international criminal law. Um, and the second one was international trade law, um, specifically about the convention on international sale of goods. So it had two uh, mentions of international. And uh, off I went to that supervisor and did uh, that dissertation. Um, but this is where, you know, um, I guess the rest of my career got shaped is it was literally doing that dissertation that um, opened my eyes and I began to actually learn about things 
um, that I had never heard of before. I had literally never heard the word arbitration before. I think there was like, you know, like a skin mention of it in contract law. Um, I began um, seeing things about maritime law and aviation and international insurance and how things are getting moved around um, that literally affect all of us because, I mean, here we are, um, you know, you've got, I believe Allison's in Dubai, I'm in the north of England, Chrissy, uh, you might be in Qatar or uh, Dubai at the moment, we've got people from all over the place, um, and all of the stuff in our rooms is being shipped international, so that that became a real fascination for me, even more than kind of the, the big um, diplomacy stuff, so um, doing that dissertation kind of uh, made made me who I eventually became, I guess. Um, um, so this was just as the financial crisis was kicking up. Um, there wasn't really a lot of training contracts going around anyways. Um, so I applied and did a LLM, a master's in law, uh, back in New York. Uh, and I specifically did it on international trade and on international commercial arbitration. So that was a year of doing that. It, it, it still boggles my mind that I managed to pull off um, seven, eight years of higher education for somebody that is, uh, you know, the least academic human being that could uh, be found. Um, and then I eventually, um, and I'll sort of get into it a little bit um, as you guys are discussing about um, um, qualifying and getting your first job, but, um, you know, uh, it took me a while to get into the first firm. Um, I qualified in New York and then uh, I began working for a small firm that specialized in um, insurance law, specifically on international trade um, uh, disputes. So I did that. And, um, you know, New York is sort of notorious for its long hours. Uh, it was an extremely busy time um, for a number of reasons. Um, and I had a friend that was living in Dubai um, who was doing investment banking. And because of my sort of background and um, that I spoke Arabic um, and understood it, um, I thought, well, you know, in New York, I'm just another associate, whereas in Dubai, I might be able to, to have something else to it. So um, I began literally um, by getting a LinkedIn account. I didn't have one at the time. This is sort of 2013. And literally was messaging people in law firms in Dubai, asking them, how do you get to Dubai um, um, in terms of a career? I eventually ended up in a, in a small boutique firm uh, that practiced quite a lot of maritime law in Dubai. And I was there for just about three, four months when I met um, a, a guy named Jonathan Brown, um, who recruited me into a firm called Haddafin Partners. He was a partner and had recently taken up the international trade um, uh, post there. Um, so he recruited me and we worked there together for three years. He became my mentor, my best friend, um, uh, like a second dad. And um, he was then headhunted to open up the uh, Dubai office for the English firm Charles Russell Speechleys. Um, he brought me along with him. And that was a really fun experience because that was, while it was an established English firm, um, sort of, it was very much like a startup. You know, we, we began, it was just the two of us on laptops in Costa Coffee because the service um, office that we had in JLT, the internet wasn't as, as good as Costa, um, to then ending up in DIFC with a headcount of about 25 lawyers. Um, that was a really fun experience because I got to work on all the things that you need to um, do for a new office, like work on things like, uh, you know, what kind of KYC procedures do you need? What sort of um, kind of general corporate trade license type work that you need? Um, so up until then, I had kind of been primarily a disputes lawyer, specifically on um, arbitrations, but 
kind of doing all of this stuff for this startup firm um, kind of widened my horizon into general uh, regulatory work, corporate work, etc. cetera. Um, at the, and then um, Jonathan retired um, beginning of 2020. And um, I continued at Charles Russell. And then I went off to where I am now at uh, Davison & Co., um, where I became a partner and began their uh, international trade and arbitration practice. Um, and that's grown. And even since then, with the evolution of, um, and I also do quite a lot with startups, again, from my background with um, CRS, and um, started doing quite a lot into fraud and cryptocurrency type work. So that's kind of the, the journey that I've had here. Um, I would call it a bit more of a marathon than a sprint and sort of ended up doing something I had no idea existed 15, 10 years ago, but here we are. Brilliant. Well, if, if you ever thought that law was linear or there was only one way to go, then I think those two stories have definitely blown that out of the water. Two very different stories, very two very different routes into law and two very different career paths now at this point. I thank you both for, for talking through those. Uh, I know one thing that's on quite a lot of people's minds who are potentially moving to the UAE from elsewhere is whether you have to do any additional qualifications or retrain or anything else in order to practice in the UAE? I mean, I can see, Alison, you, you shaking your head. Do you want to just, just say briefly what the answer is? There's loads of fab questions. Sorry, I was trying to keep up with them all. Uh, just as very more Thank you. Sorry to, sorry to those of you I've not got back to just yet. Um, so no, you don't need to requalify here. We have quite a few graduates or trainees in, in old language uh, within PwC legal. Similarly, we had trainees at Linklaters, we had trainees at Al Um, You don't need to re-qualify here. Um, you're fine with your uh, qualification from whichever jurisdiction you're coming from. You have to be registered with the legal affairs department. That's something which the law firm within who employs you will organize for you. And just as the UK got rid of doing CPD, continuing professional development, the UAE brought it in. So that was back in 2016. So the one requirement that you do have to do is fulfill what's known over here as CLPD hours per year. And Raymond probably can tell us what the numbers are on that because I've forgotten. It's about, is it about 16 hours, Raymond, we have to do? Yeah. I think in the next uh, day, I'm probably going to have to do all of them because um, I've been very naughty. And, <laughs> yeah, I've been so naughty and haven't touched a single one yet. But yeah, um, no, it, uh, Alison's completely right. I mean, I, I, I qualified in New York and initially moved out. And then when I joined CRS, um, I did the conversion um, and also became English qualified, became an English um, advocate as well. So, um, so yes, um, as long as you're qualified somewhere, um, you can uh, use that qualification uh, to be a registered, uh, what's known as a legal consultant, because um, a little bit like the UK, it's um, you have legal consultants that are effectively foreign um, lawyers, and then you have advocates, which are, um, you have to be a UAE national having graduated from um, uh, a UAE law school to have rights of audience to the local courts. Uh, we can get into the nitty gritty of it. But yes, the uh, CLPDs are there. They've gotten slightly easier in the sense that they're 100% um, online now. But uh, yes, you do have to fulfill 16 hours of them. Um, and don't be like me leaving it to you know, mid-December before you, you, you get the, uh, the email um, that you haven't done any. Good, no, that, that's really useful advice. Good to know that it's actually a broadly similar process, actually. And sort of just before we kind of jump into some of the questions, if you're a little bit earlier on the process, if you're a student and you're studying in a different jurisdiction and you're just about to complete your law degree, can and you're thinking about that you'd actually like to do your training contract or qualify in the UAE, can you apply for training contracts in UAE-based firms in exactly the same way than you as you would in the UK? And if so, where's the best way to kind of go about finding those opportunities that are directly in the UAE? I'll come to Alison first. Yeah, so just building on what I said earlier, um, thanks Chrissy. In PC Legal, we have a graduate or trainee programme. So we take on, I think we've got 
eight trainees per intake. So it's very, we mirror the UK um, process in so far as we do, we bring in probably eight in September and then another six to eight in March, four seats. So within PUC Legal, we cover virtually all practice areas that you'd find in a traditional law firm. We put people through the SQE one and two. We have interns who come and work for us. Um, I've got an intern, well, she's now a graduate in my team because she was absolutely fantastic. She came to us through, and this is a potentially good way in. She literally sent our head of legal a message on LinkedIn and said, I'd like to come and intern with you. Is that a possibility? And he said, yeah, why don't you come in? So she did a, about four months with us. It was unpaid, unfortunately, it is unpaid. Um, but she was so brilliant that we've kept her on and she's now on the graduate scheme, sitting her SQE one in January and then SQE following that. So um, yeah, we have, we have trainees or graduates um and other law firms do and I know that the magic circle firms from my experience of working at link Laters, they cycle their you know you get an option to do one of your seats um in a different jurisdiction and so they have a constant stream of trainees that come through there are opportunities to do a half and half so some firms you can do half of your training contract here and half somewhere else the UK Singapore Hong Kong etc it just depends on the firm really and are those sorts of things just advertised on your website? If you go to the like PwC Legal Middle East part, will there be like a career section and that's where those sort of things? Yeah, there should be. And I don't want to kind of open the floodgates, but I'm super happy to be connected to, to everybody. I know that a few people have already connected with me on LinkedIn just as we've been chatting. Um, but we tend to advertise. We don't really use recruiters. We tend to advertise on LinkedIn. That's the go-to platform for us for jobs, mm -hmm. as well as if you look on our website, it, it's more the case that you'll find jobs advertised on LinkedIn though. There's a bit of a catch up with the website being updated with, with jobs as well. And is it similar to the UK in terms of that you have a certain time of year where you recruit for trainees? Is it sort of a September intake? So you have certain deadlines when you take people? Yeah, I think we're slightly more fluid. We're a bit more nimble and flexible than, than the traditional law firms. So we start to, we get inundated with CVs, as you might imagine, but that process starts in earnest. Interviews is around April, May time with people being kind of notified very quickly afterwards with the start of September. Yeah, so it's for that September intake, and then when we do a March intake, obviously we row back a bit from there, and that's probably that process starts probably around October time. So we get the new team settled in September, and then we start to look at the March intake. Brilliant, that's that's so so helpful, uh, Raymond. I know you work for a slightly different type of organisation. Does does that mean that the process is different in terms of applying for opportunities with you? Do you offer training contracts in the same way at, at certain times? Um, what I would say is, I mean, certainly when I was at CRS, it followed very much the the uh, the system that uh, that Allison's discussed. So we would either take um, intern, uh, I'm sorry, we take trainees uh, at specific times, or um, uh, you kind of had that rotating uh, uh, training section from our offices in the UK um, or elsewhere into the region. Um, it's been really interesting because I've, I've I've been in Dubai now for uh, almost nine years, and I think I think it's really evolved over the the the, the course of time, especially depending on the type of firm that um, that you're going for. Certainly, uh, what Allison's discussing is is um, works for the bigger international firms, uh, Magic Circle, uh, uh, Silver Circle, or just uh, your general. Um, in, international firms. I think once you kind of come down to um, the next layer of that, um, it be the process becomes a lot more flexible, shall we say, um, where, I mean, in our office, uh, literally all of the trainees that we've had started with us as paralegals, um, just as a general um, uh, app application that they filled out. I don't think there's anything on our website that that uh, necessarily said it. They just had an interesting um, CV. We hired them um, as paralegals, and then they moved up to being trainees. Um, one of them is just about to qualify, and she'll um, become an associate with us. So um, 
I, th I would say that that the process can be kind of um, very, very much similar to a traditional UK firm um, with the larger firms. Um, once you start getting into the the kind of um, mid-size boutique firms, it becomes a lot more of a flexible um, manner of doing things. Brilliant. That's really, really helpful. And just sort of one more question around this. If if you're kind of accepting applications just kind of through your website and through it for various different roles, do you have a preference for people who are already there? Or do you still kind of count people who are applying from the UK and they plan or elsewhere and, and plan to move there? Is, do, does it help if you're already kind of in situ in the UAE? Are either of you, you know, happy to start with you, Raymond, and then, you know, it might be different for, for each of you. Um, I mean, I... I think it's always kind of helpful. I mean, I think certainly when I first moved out, there was this kind of um, weird thing that everybody wanted to hire somebody that had at least a number of years experience in a traditional jurisdiction like New York or London or et cetera. Um, there's certainly been a, a significant shift away from that, especially in the past two or three years where um, it doesn't necessarily matter as much. Um, I mean, one of our trainees literally was was born in Dubai, uh, grew up there, and the only thing that she did was uh, obtain her law degree in the UK, and then moved straight back and and, and began um, working. So I don't necessarily think that there's a specific um, reason for it. It might depend on the type of practice that you're doing. Um, for things more on the transactional side, it's uh, it, it probably doesn't matter as much. I think disputes, you still get a little bit of um, wanting that, that little bit of kind of local knowledge um, to it. But I think ultimately it really comes down to the, the specific um, candidate themselves. I don't think that there's a one size fits all, to be honest. Yeah, brilliant. Um, Alison, over to you. Are there, are there any sort of thoughts from PwC point of view, whether it's, it's any different? In terms of whether somebody is in country or somewhere else, yeah. In terms of whether you kind of have a preference of people who were who were already there, um, I think it's easier if the, if people are here because there's no kind of delay, so to speak, and there's a familiarity with the country, the region. Um, but it just depends on who we need to recruit and at what level. Um, I think at a junior level. I'm just thinking whether I think the majority of our juniors have come in from living in Dubai, having done a little bit of work experience in Dubai. Um, more senior people have relocated from other jurisdictions, but there's no one size fits all, really. I guess it depends on the role and the candidate that we're looking for. But I think on the whole, we tend to recruit locally um, or, or, or within to buy people at a junior level who are already here. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And, and on that theme, you sort of mentioned, you know, it depends on, on what you need and what type of people you're recruiting for. There's a couple of questions that have come up before and also in the chat now about whether there are any sort of specific skills or areas of law that are kind of more popular in the UAE where you're kind of more likely to be recruited or there's more jobs available. Would you say there is kind of particular focus on, on certain areas? Is that back to me? Yes, I'll put yeah. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll put across to, to Raymond as well. It's a really interesting question because I think it again depends on who you're going to work for. So we don't do any disputes work. So PGC Legal, we don't do any disputes work in so far as we can't litigate against our clients because we're a, we've got a huge audit practice. So yeah. it would become extremely complicated if we started to take action against <laughs> against any of our clients. So we don't do disputes work. We, where there's an exception to that is our employment law team will do the occasional dispute on a, you know, on an individual, but nothing bigger than that. But they're very rare, those cases. So we tend to do, um, we're a corp, we've got quite a large corporate practice, fintech, banking team, employment law team, commercial lawyers. We don't currently have any real estate lawyers. I think that's something that's going to be looked at potentially. Um, we've got an entity governance and compliance team. Um, I think they're the main areas that we that we that we've got covered. 
there's a, there's a few gaps there, obviously. So we haven't got TMT lawyers. That's a gap to plug. So we're on a quite an aggressive growth trajectory. So we're currently within the region, and this may sound a small number, um, but we're quite big for for this region. We're at around 65 lawyers, um, but with the aim of doubling in size in the next kind of 12 to 18 months. Um, so there are a few obvious gaps in that full service offering compared to, I'm sure where uh, Raymond's firm and certainly the firms that I've worked for previously, but it's a, it's a case of us, the way that we operate alongside the rest of PWC, it's where are those opportunities and the types of lawyers that we need to, to work alongside somebody in consulting or assurance or deals or wherever they sit. Yeah, that's really helpful because PwC League is obviously quite a different type of model to a yeah. traditional law firm, for example. So that's kind of why I wanted you both here really to sort of talk about yeah. the different sides of it. So I'm going to pass that over to Raymond as well to talk about the sorts of, of you know, areas that, you know, you recruit for in, in your work and the things that you've experienced as well from the sort of private practice side of things. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's really interesting. Um, I mean, Dubai used to be a little bit more cyclical in, in it, um, where you'd have tired of times where Kind of transactional work wouldn't be as as busy but um you know uh, uh, disputes work there's always enough disputes work going around what i would say the only caveat to that is there was a time period where the um kind of large uh, construction project uh disputes were going on those were mostly resulting from the the um the uh, the global crisis that happened um, I, I would say most, if not all of those have kind of died away and those kind of very large scale um, construction disputes aren't really um, there as much. Um, you always have construction um, related work, be it on the transactional side or the dispute side, just because of the nature of, of Dubai. Um, but I would say during COVID and, and slightly before then, um, the diversification that's happened with, within this, this region has been really interesting because traditionally you used to have a lot of oil and gas work, um, quite a lot of project work, construction work. Um, those were sort of the, the big ticket items. You had a lot of trade issues as well for obvious reasons um, of the location of Dubai. But I, 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 I could probably say that there's been um, I mean, certainly what we've been witnessing and our firm is considered sort of uh, small to midsize with having kind of a 25 lawyer headcount. Um, I, I don't think that there's one area that is um, super busy and another area where they're reading newspapers. Um, it's kind of fairly even, even all around. There's quite a lot of real estate um, going around. Um, there's quite a lot of just general uh, corporate work. Um, so there isn't really one particular thing. I mean, if I was to scroll down my, my inbox or my sort of files, it would be kind of all over the place in terms of those matters. Um, one thing I think that, that you know, if, if you're, um, that I've certainly found over the uh, time that I've been in Dubai is, um, and this is a little bit different if you're working for the, the kind of larger uh, firms, but uh, once you kind of get into the, the midsize and other firms, um, the more um, hats that you can wear, the more uh, marketable you are. I think that there's certainly in a marketplace like London or New York, um, there's kind of striving for people to become experts and specialists in one particular area. Whereas I think here, well, uh, not here, uh, within Dubai, there's a, a, a happiness by clients that, that you can become their sort of uh, general counsel, as it were, um, rather than sort of being a one trick pony. So um, the more that you can become of that, I think the, the more useful uh, you are in this place. Yeah, that that's yeah, I, I think that's that's really helpful advice. I mean, one thing that I have noticed a little bit, and I don't know whether it's just because I've sort of spent more time and I know more kind of commercial lawyers than others, but I see sort of more of a prevalence of the sort of commercial type sectors. And I have had a couple of questions previously and in this 
chat section today about whether you want to be more of a private client lawyer if you want to do kind of more family law or personal injury law or something like that is is there as much of that in the UAE or is that handled tends to be handled by local firms is it different law that applies is that a slightly different construction or is it just as popular it's just that that I haven't seen it um I'll pass that to, to Alison first yeah it's a great question we've got uh, we've actually got within our corporate team one of the verticals is a family business vertical so we've got a team that supports we've got lots of big family businesses across the region who've got portfolios of companies um and need support so we've got whether it's the right fit whether they should be sitting within corporate is a something to think about but they, there's a team of i think we've got about four or five lawyers that sit within corporate looking at family business um requirements and requests that come in um and it can be across a whole host of different different challenges questions support that's needed by those family businesses the key thing there though that we find is that we need arabic speakers within that particular team um and i think they are almost without exception arabic speakers that's really helpful to know that was another question that i was going to ask but it, so you're saying that sort of for those specific areas that's that's almost absolutely necessary but is that generally yeah, the case yeah. across the board for yeah, all sectors yeah. yeah i think it's i think it's there's a tendency for those family business to prefer to have somebody as an arabic speaker that said you know it's not a prerequisite to be an arabic speaker and certainly for us we will we we absolutely embrace bringing in um, lawyers from across the region because they know the region better than we do a lot of the times. Um, and we need to ensure that we're able to build relationships with our clients. So I did a, quite a big project early last year and it was for a family business actually. It was looking at the transformation of their legal function to build a fit for future legal function. So looking at you know the people processes strategy technology aspects of what they were doing and we spoke to each of the lawyers within the legal department which was about I think we had about 25 lawyers and there were quite a few of them that didn't speak English as a first language fair enough I don't speak any Arabic so one of my team who is Egyptian she just conducted all those interviews with them in in Arabic and then kind of paraphrased it all back for me um Saudi I think there's there's more of a I think it's more considerate for us to have Arabic speakers particularly with some of our big big Saudi clients and we're working for all of the big giga projects many of the government entities over there big corporates um and I think it's wrong of me to expect somebody to just immediately start speaking in English so I think from a from a courtesy perspective it's good for us to have a balance of people who can speak Arabic and people who don't but it's not a it's not a prerequisite at all that family business little team I think it's that's how it's been built and also it's a selling point to be able to say look we we've got Arabic speakers native Arabic speakers for you Brilliant. Well, that's really good to know, because I think that's sort of a, a perhaps a misconception that you, you know, you won't have a chance of getting a job in the UA if you're not an Arabic speaker. I don't think that's the case. And, you know, you've just confirmed oh. that in terms of sort of other skills. We've had a couple of questions about the NQ market and kind of how you can how you can stand out in that job market. So what sorts of things, you know, what sorts of skills, what sorts of things, if you were looking for a candidate would make you you know what sorts of things would impress you if particularly kind of looking to recruit in that region or is there anything different for that region that would be in another um i'll come to you first raymond um yeah it's a really interesting question i think i think the more um uh, what i found really interesting is um when i first began my uh career uh, with my background it was extremely difficult because i didn't fit the mold um, of a, a new graduate. Um, so there was a lot of questions as to why I, um, I, when I would apply to training contracts, for example, in the UK, I would get the question of why did I start out in, in the US? When I would apply to jobs in the US, they'd ask me why I did my law degree in the UK. So um, anything that didn't fit the mold seemed to be uh, obscure and was a hindrance. Whereas I find that the more unique and the more varied you are in Dubai, the more exciting um, you are to employers. So um, 
certainly if you don't fit the mold, if you've lived abroad, if you have um, other languages, if you have other skills, if you have a different background or have had a, a, uh, a career before you decided that you wanted to become a lawyer, um, those are all very helpful traits, I would say. Um, whereas, I mean, I believe things have, have changed over time since um, I started, but certainly I think um, in a more traditional market, uh, you kind of need to fit that mold and need to fit the time frame. Whereas I think in Dubai, it's a bit more flexible and the more unique you are, the, the better of a chance that you have. Brilliant. That, that's really helpful. And in terms of the best place to sort of look for NQ roles, is there any is there any sort of central place which advertise them? Is it LinkedIn? Is that the best place to go? Or is it individual firm websites or is there anywhere else? Uh, Alison, sorry, I'll come to you yeah. first. Um, yeah, so like I mentioned earlier, we generally we tend to put stuff out on LinkedIn. Um, and then what happens is we'll put an ad out will get a lot of CVs as most organizations will. There's a filter, our, our human capital team will kind of filter through those CVs. I tend to ask them to send me all of the CVs because I, it's not that I don't trust them, but I think there's sometimes really interesting candidates can be missed because going back to Raymond's point, they may not fit like the, the mold. And this became even more, kind of relevant to me when I was teaching at Nottingham Law School actually and I taught on the part-time course as well as the full-time LPC course and we had some amazing students on the part-time course who were doing a full-time job during the week and then coming in doing the LPC at the weekend and they you know weren't people who got three A stars at A level or whatever whatever but they were super impressive and so I tend to ask to see all CVs because there's some really interesting people out there who've done some really you know really quite impressive stuff in their short or long career and I just always want to kind of cast my eye over those CVs so I tend to say can you send them all and I'll go through that process and then then there will be a filtering process and we'll have a look but I agree with Raymond you know it's quite it's quite good to see people who've you know might have done something different and and I don't think anybody should think that the expectation is that you've got these A-levels well certainly not for us you've got these A-levels you've done this back scheme you've done etc cetera, etc cetera, because we'll we'll we, we take a bit of a broader view than that because we want people who are interesting bring energy com some commercial awareness there which are teachable interested those kind of characteristics and fun to work with yeah, that's a big one. Good personality, isn't it? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, brilliant. Now oh, that that's so helpful. And one question which has come up in a, a couple of times in the chat, actually, it's quite an interesting question about if you don't intend to spend your whole career potentially working in the UAE, potentially you might want to work in the UK again in the future if you haven't started there already. I mean, is there any sort of perceived disadvantage in either starting your legal career in the UAE or taking some time spending two or three years there and then coming back to the UK you know is it, is it considered any differently to spending time in the UK or qualifying there I'll start with you Alison because I, I think you spotted this question already and then I'll come to Raymond and I think it's a great question I think it's a great question to ask um so as you've all heard my my CV that I garbled out to you all earlier I've worked all over the world you know and, the, and in actual fact the best the best experience I ever had working in a, in a traditional law firm was in Chile and I went in with this big city one year qualified attitude I've come from this massive firm and I'm this that and the other and I'm going into this smaller firm with a partnership of five which at the time I hadn't appreciated that the Chile under Chilean law you couldn't have a partnership of more than 20, I think it was at the time. But oh my days, I was absolutely, that arrogance dissipated overnight because I was working with some of the most impressive lawyers I've ever worked with. All been to the States and done their LLMs, Fulbright Scholars, spoke you know English and Spanish fluently, super impressive people. Um, and I thought at the time, well, early on, when I was thinking, oh my God, how am I going to go back and re-enter the UK market with this name of a Chilean law firm, which nobody's going to have heard of, 
how am I going to get back into the UK market? In actual fact, the experience I had was amazing because I wasn't one of a massive intake of people. I was just dropped in at the deep end on day one and the learning curve was pretty steep. Um, and I'd gone from being in a cohort of, I think we were about 90 at the time of trainees. And then suddenly I was this one year qualified gringa in a Chilean law firm having to work out how to do an ADR listing in London, New York and Santiago. I was like, I don't even know what an ADR is. What is that? But they, so it was an amazing, amazing experience. And I think you find the same here. I think because the law firms aren't as big, um, you can't hide. You can't sit in the library and read the newspaper, which I used to do as a trainee. Um, when I was supposed to been doing some research, you can't do that because you, you're fully engaged from the get-go. There's a lot of opportunities the work's really interesting the Middle East is booming there's a lot of chatter globally about what we're doing in the region so I think it's yeah I mean I've never kind of seen it as a barrier from all of the jurisdictions that I've worked in for a re-entry into the UK market I think it probably enhances but it's part of that is making sure you land in the right place and that you've got the right you know the work is engaging because it's not a you know rainbows and unicorns across all law firms here at all so that's the tricky bit I think yeah that that kind of leads on to a question I was going to ask a little bit more about the practicalities of actually kind of living and working in Dubai you both worked in lots of different countries in lots of different places in versions of legal careers I mean in terms of kind of actual sort of quality of life work-life balance you know how it is to live and work in Dubai <laughs> Great. I mean, yeah, I mean, feel free to, to, to say, Alison, you know, how you found it. Well, I've had to put a cardigan on earlier today because the temperature dropped to about 27 degrees. Sorry, everybody in the UK. Sorry, Raymond. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> it was a bit chilly. They could do the air the conditioning down a little bit. It's a bit cold here. No, I absolutely love it. So it's super. It's for those of you, I think there's a couple of people on the chat have said that they're moving over here. It is an amazing place to live. Everybody's really friendly. I've personally found it extremely safe. Um, there's loads of stuff to do. And the sun shines 363 days of the year. <laughs> but it's great. It, yeah, yeah. I don't I, pay any tax, just to make it well, yeah, that's that's an, that's another question as well. I mean, I'll pass this one over to Raymond. In terms of, you know, there's all this kind of notorious, oh, you get paid so much more in Dubai and it's tax free and it, it it's the dream. You know, is is that really the case? Do you kind of just want to kind of explain that for, you know, a minute for people who don't necessarily know yet what the what the situation is in Dubai? Yeah, I mean, I mean, firstly, I think um, Allison's hit 100 um, percent and I couldn't have said it better uh, within terms of both. Um, having those transferable skills, um, as well as um, in terms of loving the body. One thing I would sort of say just in my own experience in, uh, in terms of transferable skills, I, mean, I never physically, uh, technically worked in London per se. When I was at Charles Russell, I was uh, shifting between Dubai, um, Saudi and, and London. Um, but I mean, I get more English work now than I probably would have ever gotten um, had I just moved over. I think part of it has to be the type of work that you do. So, I mean, obviously with, with my line, um, you tend to have a bit of an international flavor to it. So it doesn't necessarily matter where, where you are. Um, I think that's probably true in Allison's world in, uh, in terms of bank, banking and finance. Because um, uh, I... So, I see that as well because my wife is a banking and finance lawyer. So, so I mean, um, there's probably some practice areas that would be a little bit more challenging to have transferable skills, but um, far and few in between if you're practicing in Dubai. Um, and certainly the more globalized we become and the more that I think Dubai is becoming more uh, looked at as a more serious um, jurisdiction. There's obviously, I mean, um, when I first moved, the the view was that, you know, you're in Dubai having a holiday, that you're just kind of uh, working uh, at the beach, you know, um, um, and that was very much not, not the way it was. Um, I mean, I was putting in some very serious hours, um, 
But what I would say is, I mean, I had a bit of a taste for that in New York because we weren't a huge firm and we were very busy. So, um, you know, I didn't have that kind of traditional, here's, let, let me train you as a young lawyer. It was a little bit of having to train yourself. But that was certainly the case when I moved to Dubai um, with virtually everything that I've, that I've done. It's kind of just been learning it as you go along. Um, so there's a bit of excitement to that. I think those that are expecting that kind of traditional, you know, you will have a supervisor that is going to hold your hand and take you through things. Um, that's probably not going to work very well unless you're maybe at some of the uh, magic circle firms. So um, just in terms of that, in terms of what I found in terms of uh, work-life balance, having come from New York, um, I mean, it was immediately, even though I was working long hours, there was a, a few things that were massively different. Um, number one, I didn't have a huge commute that I had to do. Um, my commute in New York was an hour and a half if everything went well. Um, you know, um, whereas even when I first moved to Dubai, I was living in the marina, if those of you um, know where that is. And um, the office I was working at was in Emar Square. And it was literally door to door was 30 minutes. And to me, that was amazing. Currently, um, if I'm not working from home, my door to door is about 10 minutes. Um, so you don't really have those kind of very long commutes um, unless you actively choose to live in a time that you, you could literally leave your office at six o'clock, seven o'clock, whatever it is and be at your house in 10 minutes, 15 minutes, uh, et cetera. So that was a huge saving. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't know anybody that doesn't like, you catch that? sorry, Try my it. Apple Watch is deciding to join in the conversation. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know anybody that wouldn't uh, enjoy the kind of weather that you get in Dubai for the majority of the time. Yes, it gets in crazy hot in the summertime where there's not much to do outside. Um, with the more flexible working that it's become, most people are being able to spend their entire summers um, elsewhere. But there's also a huge indoor facilities to do things uh, because the place is built for the heat. So unlike when we were here, for example, in, in July and the temperature was 25 and everybody was baking in England, uh, you know, 25 in Dubai is sort of a cool weather that you're going to be uh, a bit chilly in your house. Um, so, you know, it, for me, I think that that kind of work-life balance has only gotten better as I've progressed and certainly during COVID with, with the flexibility that you've gotten. Um, you know, I don't know many, many uh, partners at law firms in London or even in Manchester or Birmingham that have the level of flexibility that I have where they can literally be training for an Ironman uh, and the hours that that takes. Um, and still being able to maintain a practice and a few side hustles. So, so I think that that's there. In terms of salaries, yes, the salary is tax-free. There's no income tax. There's no tax whatsoever with the exception of 5% VAT, which is still significantly less than uh, you would get anywhere else. Um, uh, salaries do tend to be on a higher pay scale um, than most places in the UK obviously with certain variations. Um, I think in terms of cost of living, it's probably on par with, with London. Um, certainly it's, it's more expensive than Birmingham or Manchester or elsewhere outside of London. Um, I would say that you certainly get more bang for your buck in, uh, in Dubai in terms of um, housing than you would in London. Bearing in mind that you're also saving on time because wherever you live in London, you have a minimum of an hour's uh, commute. So um, for me, I think it's it's significantly better. Anytime that either myself or my wife have been approached to do something in London or elsewhere, uh, and we crunch the numbers, it's always made a hell of a lot more sense for us to stay in Dubai. Uh, and plus, we're not looking at a high of uh, minus one. Um, so well, I think Chris, it, it, just one last thing for me to add is that um, yeah. as is the norm with most people who move to Dubai we came for three years and I've now been here for nine 
So I think that hopefully kind of summarises what a great place it is to live. Uh, and similarly for me, I went for COVID and keep saying I'm not coming back. And then I find myself keep keep going back. Uh, so, yeah, it is that sort of place. Okay, I think you can shout out to Abu Dhabi. Yeah, Jeff, we got you. Abu Dhabi as well. Yeah. UAE. Yeah. Yeah, the UAE. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I completely agree with that. I mean, my wife and I were uh, just good. My wife is English. Uh, we were looking to go to Dubai to get sort of a two year stint and then uh, make our way to the UK. Um, that was a two year plan and here, here we are nine years later. So yeah, completely agree. Yeah, and the, the, I think the quality of life does make a huge difference. I mean, the weather makes it, if you're the person who gets seasonally affected like, like I do, just waking up to like brilliant sunshine streaming through your window every morning and just being able to, you know, walk down. You know, if you live in the marina, walk around the marina on your way to the gym, it does make a huge difference. You can do the same work in two locations, but feel very, very differently about it. So it does make a difference. And if you have any questions about, if you're moving to Dubai, have any questions about lifestyle, where to live, where to go out, how to meet people, please feel free to direct those to me these two are certainly the experts about how to find jobs and employment but I can definitely help you if you've got kind of more practical questions about about life in Dubai I know we are out of time and, I, and I'm very respectful of you know everyone's time and it's particularly you know yours and Raymond's and Alison's today who've given up an hour to speak to us and provide some massively massively helpful insight and all of you should just come and live with us in Dubai <laughs> which I think has probably been the the overriding outcome of it and I'm glad we finished that way I know there are some questions that we haven't had a chance to get to I do do Q&A's most weeks on my Instagram so if you have anything left over that I can answer please feel free to put them on there um, I know, you know, Alison, you've, you've volunteered your LinkedIn as well. And I know, Raymond, before you yeah. have. Oh, definitely, for sure. Uh, you know, feel free to get in touch with me. Um, email, LinkedIn, um, Instagram, whatever, whatever method that you can find to, to, uh, to get a hold of me, by all means, feel free. And likewise for me, my only just caveat is I'm traveling back to the UK uh, at the end of the week. So there might be a bit of delay in me getting back to you all, but I will promise I will not forget you. I will get back to you, but it may take me a couple of weeks to do so. Thank you so, so much. You've both been so insightful, have such brilliant stories, brilliant journeys, and, you know, the atypical lawyer story, which is what we're all about in the LAB camp. So I hope that's given some of you some insight and some inspiration and definitely some information about how to move. I will let you get on with the rest of your day. And for those of you who couldn't make it, have been in and out, it is being recorded. I will send out a copy of the recording to everybody who signed up for the event. So don't panic if you missed some of it. Thank you all so much and enjoy the rest of your days. Thanks, Christine. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, bye, bye. bye. bye.